everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today's guest is Dr. Howie Jacobson. He has a wonderful podcast. If you haven't listened to it, I really want you to check it out. He's co-written many books with some of the luminaries in the plant-based world, and he's here today to check in and see what he's been up to and tell us about the new book he's writing. Please welcome Dr. Howie Jacobson. It's very nice to see you again. Hey, it's beautiful to see you too. It's been a long time. I know. You know, I can't believe it because I remember contacting you a year ago and you were in lockdown in another country. What was that like? Yeah. Um, well, so we were, uh, we were, my family and I went to South Africa. It was, we, we had lived there like nine years earlier. And so we kind of wanted to just sort of go back, see people. Um, we had a friend who's in her 80s who was planning on moving. And so we thought it was like, you know, uh, it wasn't a great time to go. Um, and then it got like, we, you know, we bought the tickets in like November of 2019. And then it just kept getting worse and worse. And like, should we go? We had to stop in New York. And we kind of just made this, I think it was probably a dumb decision. Like, oh, let's just go for it. Like, um, it really wasn't clear how bad this was gonna get. And then we, then we got there and there was only three, there's like three cases in South Africa of COVID by the time we arrived, but there was hysteria. And at that point, New York was starting to get bad. So like, imagine going to, a, to somewhere and everybody thinks you have the plague. <laughs> like, the, you know, the, like, we're, first thing we're supposed to register with the government, tell them everywhere we were going. Like, I don't, I don't wanna do that with my government, let alone, South Africa. And then the, the tourism board came and said, you have to get all the, you know, it was, it was very weird and scary. And then we, we, um, we were going to be traveling around, but we couldn't. All the flights were canceled. You couldn't even, there were checkpoints. You couldn't get a rental car and drive from one province to another. So we're like, okay, well, we're stuck here in the place that we first went to. Um, and we can't afford to stay at this hotel, <laughs> like indefinitely. Like you know, like you can't afford to stay at a fancy hotel for a long time. Like what are we going to do? Um, we started looking at flights home, and just about that point, the airline went bankrupt. South African Airways stopped flying, and like I'm, I'm a very rational person. <laughs> Like I'm always thinking about like, what are the possibilities? I don't get hysterical. So my wife said, you know, South African Airways has been like in chapter 11 bankruptcy for a while. Are we sure we should book on them? I'm like, look, honey, it's a national airline of a large country. They're not gonna just let them, they let them. So now we can't leave and we have to find a place and we end up finding this, um, uh, a place that has like 12 bungalows on a 80 acres. So it wasn't like, you know, little hotel rooms and like, okay, you guys stay there. We're not allowed to go out. We're not allowed to go shopping. We're not allowed to walk around. This was when like people in South Africa were getting fined and jailed for walking their dogs outside. Like they thought, you know, we know now that outside is like the safest place to be. But at that point, like, no. So um, the guy who owned this place um, you know, they, everybody else had left, like we're the only people there. He's supposed to go and get our groceries for us. He's like old and has asthma. He's like risk profile for COVID. We're like, we're not gonna let you do that. And he's like, well, but the government can take away my license. So <laughs> I ended up like hopping the fence and walking to the grocery store and back and hoping no one would see me. So like, I'm, I'm like, basically, you know, aside from paying, I'm like stealing food, like breaking all these laws. And that's kind of what it was like until then finally the US State Department said, hey, we have one flight if you want to take it. Otherwise, we don't know when you'll ever be able to come home. So, so that, was that scary for your family? Um, it might have been. I mean, we, we, we were in a pretty remote area. Like what I was concerned about was like the thing was gonna spread in townships. It was gonna spread in Johannesburg. It was gonna to spread to like really highly populated areas that are, all, that are already immunocompromised 
because of HIV. Um, the government is, is essentially, is, is largely in, incompetent and corrupt. Like I was worried about like civil breakdown. I, and I was also worried about um, supply chains breaking down because where we were, it doesn't really grow much of anything. There's like a, a, a rural Zulu area that had some resorts, like everything was trucked in. And it's like, yeah, you know, so the first thing I did when, when we realized we were in lockdown is like, I went and bought like, like all these staples, like, you know, 50 pounds of rice. And it's really interesting. Like, you know, so, so when I think about eating well, like I think about like really high level, I think about you and um, Dr. Goldhammer. Like you're my sort of like, you would never ever deviate. Like, you know, <laughs> and here we were and like, the best you can do is like bake beans with sugar, <laughs> right? It was like really interesting to think about food as survival. Like I wasn't gonna have the meat, I wasn't gonna have the cheese, but like, you know what? White flour and sugar could save our lives. Like it was really interesting to think about what am I getting, you know, and they don't have any brown rice in these little, like think, you know, the stores there, you know, imagine like, a tiny little general store outside of like a, um, a national park. You know, they've got Chef Boyardee, they've got flashlight batteries, they've got tampons, they've got, you know, Siggy yo yo yogurt or something, but that's it. Like there's no, this isn't Whole Foods. It's not Wegmans. And so like, okay, well, white rice, like that was, that was the best we could do for like two weeks. And it was, it was really interesting to, to see like, how, you know, how your standards change when you're, when, when you're, uh, when your goals change. Wow. Well, just so you know, I'm not as perfect as Dr. Goldhammer. I love white rice, white basmati, and I do eat it. And I think in an emergency, I would be a lot less strict. How long did you end up staying there over the time that your vacation was scheduled for? Yeah, we stayed for an extra, say, week and a half. Uh, it felt like much more because like the vacation lasted for two days. Like it was clear, like once we got there, like, oh, we've, this, this was a big mistake. Yeah, I mean, you know, it was, I mean, I'm glad we went. It was painful. We, we had a lot of, you know, it was me and my wife and my two adult children. And we were kind of like forced to confront each other in ways that we hadn't. Um, so there was a lot of, a lot of painful growth in there. Um, but basically it was a month in, in a kind of limbo and I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me because like we were in a beautiful part of the world. Like, you know, it really is a, it's not a life threatening problem that, oh, there's the mountain that I want to go hike in and they won't let me, you know? Um, but it was. How did you spend your days there? And were there other Americans that were stranded there as well? No, no, we, I mean, we were the only foreign elements, like everybody in this town knows each other. And we were, and we knew a lot of people from before, uh, but no, there was nobody else. It, it, then after about two weeks, a family uh, left Johannesburg because like people in, in the cities in lockdown were going crazy. Um, because one of the first things was the, 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 I guess the finance minister came on television and said, um, I beg of you, don't start um, panic buying. And up to that point, no one had been panic buying. But guess what happened the minute he said that? <laughs> panic. <laughs> panic buying. So, <laughs> um, so, you know, so this one family went from Johannesburg and they got another bungalow, like, you know, far, like 200 feet away from us. Um, the, other, the other funny thing was that there were these troops of uh, vervet monkeys who were really good at, at breaking and entering. And so we would come back and like someone, one kid had like left their bedroom window open a bit and like our, our kitchen was trashed. And like there was, you know, bread and clementines on the floor. <laughs> You know, so they, they opened the peanut butter. Um, so I, I spent my days, I did a lot of, um, I brought uh, some podcast equipment. So I did a podcast every day, just kind of 
my thoughts, what's going on. And my, all, my podcasts are all interviews. So this was different for me. This was almost all of them were just me talking for half an hour. Um, it was probably just therapy, to be honest. Are they still available on your website? Yeah, they're all there. They're like from like the 370s to 400. Nice. How many podcasts? If you joined us late, this is Dr. Howie Jacobson. He co-authored Whole with Dr. Colin Campbell, Proteinaholic with Dr. Garth Davis, Sick to Fit with Josh Lajani. He's going to be talking about an upcoming book, which is perfect for the question that has been sent in. But we're just catching up because we haven't seen each other for a while. And Monica's saying she likes your shirt. And I mentioned that too. And you, you got that in South Africa? I did. It was it was funny. Like we're like we went to this store. Like you don't buy souvenirs at the beginning of your trip, right? You buy, <laughs> we're like, oh, these are nice jackets. Like they're nice shirts. So we like three of us got them. Like uh, you know, a tiger and a lion and like whatever, and uh, a jaguar. And then like the next day, the mall closed down. Like that little that little strip mall area. I I don't know if you can see it better. That's a good looking shirt. And you're a Leo, so it's perfect. Yeah, so I, that's, I, I wore it specifically for our, for our conversation. <laughs> so how did you guys spend your days? Just worrying or actually, because you couldn't go outside pretty, pretty much. Well, we could go outside in our little, you know, in the 80 acres. So we did a lot of walking around. There was a, um, I mean, this is like a big wedding venue. So, so like uh, the bungalows and also had a big space and the owner kind of let us have the run of the place. So he had a little Wi-Fi router. So we would like huddle on this one bench that was close enough to the Wi-Fi and I would do, I would do work. Um, we would, you know, it's eight hours different, seven or eight hours difference to a uh, time difference. So like no one, you know, none of our friends or family would be awake until like two or three in the afternoon. So honestly, it felt a little bit lazy. Like there wasn't anything to do. Like, I, you know, like I'm a, I'm a fairly anxious person, just like I rev high. And it was really challenging to like, oh, there's nothing to do. Like I could go for a walk. I could, you know, make some breakfast. Um, are we low on anything? Should I sneak out to the store? <laughs> But it, it was like a reminder of subsistence. Like life doesn't, there was something nice about it was it wasn't that complicated. Like, what am I gonna do? I, I can't build a plane. I can't, like, you know, we're in conference. Like every, every three days I'd get some email from the US State Department and I'd be like, oh good, something to worry about. And then between that, it was just, oh, you know what? I'm an animal on this planet. Just, and I'm basically just trying to get my needs met. Like. I got to eat, I got to drink, I got to sleep, I got to pee, I got to, like, it, it became very simple. Did the State Department know you were there or did you actually contact them? Um, we contacted them. Um, I can't remember how I found out that they were, they were working on this. Um, but, you know, I, a lot of it's a blur. We, and then we would, you know, we would watch television and so we would see, um, you know, the South African news, and then uh, at two p.m. they had CNN. So we'd watch Andrew Cuomo when we when we thought he knew what he was talking about. Um, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember how I got in touch with the State Department, but uh, it was like a, a moment of adulting where I'm like, <laughs> I think I mean, what what re what really triggered me to do something was when I found out that our airline had gone out of business. That is something. Because we got an email. We went through, through this travel agent because they, I know nobody does that anymore, but there's one travel agent specializes in African travel and they got us really good rates. And they emailed and said, um, you're going to need to find another way home. I'm like, but I paid. And they're like, yes. I was like, that's not fair. They're like, yes. Okay. <laughs> so you never, yeah, you, when, a, when, a, when a company goes bankrupt, you don't get your money back. No. Um, I mean, it's funny because they're not entirely bankrupt. They're still flying in South Africa and they keep sending me their magazine. <laughs> I'm like, you know, we ended up um, the, <clears throat> the flights home. We didn't know how much they were going to be. Like the State Department said, we'll bill you later and sign here. And I'm like, OK, I don't think we have a choice. Like, Wow. Did you get the bill yet? Yeah, we got the bill. Um, Let's put it this way: it uh, it completely obliterated our stimulus checks. 
Wow. Well, I'm happy you're home. Yeah. Yeah. So you plant yourself podcast. That's, I don't listen to a lot of podcasts, but you're one of the ones that I do. It's fantastic. What, when did you start it? What made you start it? Do you enjoy doing it? I love it so much. I, um, I've, I mean, it's, it's the vehicle through which I've met some of my favorite people in the world. It's like when you, when you introduce this, you said, you know, I'm going to introduce you to great people. I thought of the podcast as I want to introduce myself to great people. Um, I started doing it around 2013, right when when Hole was out, and I thought like, like my my uh, my plan was I wanted to have a conversation with John Robbins, who was like you know he was the guy who started it all for me, Diet for New America, and it's like he's one of my heroes, and I would love to talk with him. And I, boy, if I have a podcast, maybe I can ask him. Like I have a you know a plausible reason for rather than just saying hey I want to talk to you I'm your fan like that sounds a little creepy you know so I started the podcast and then after like 30 episodes I'm like all right I'm ready and so I uh, emailed um, John Robbins and he was he agreed so uh, you know it's it it started out mostly me talking to cookbook authors because I wasn't very sophisticated about like the, you know, I'd written a book with Colin Campbell kind of about the science and it was all about the food, right? It was about nutrition. Like, well, who's, who's doing interesting stuff? Oh, you know, who is Happy Herbivore? She's got great books. Let's talk to Lindsay. Or um, Susan Voison has a book, has a book on uh, fat-free vegan and a blog and oh, let's talk to her and Kathy Hester and you. And, and gradually um, as, as I started talking to people and hearing their stories, I got interested in other things. Like your story is not about food, right? I mean, when you talk about your, your childhood and traumas and things you had to overcome and mindsets. So that got me really interested. So I started talking to researchers about depression, anxiety, uh, different modalities for dealing with things. I started talking to coaches. I started talking to environmentalists. Um, doctors, I, you know, and so gr gradually my, my range of interest in the podcast has expanded to the point where it's now whoever the hell I want to talk to, I'm going to talk to. And if anyone wants to listen, that's fine. Hey, so it's interesting because I've been, I didn't know that I was going to do a show every day and you are my 443rd episode since the pandemic. And I just went on your website and you've done 453 podcasts. Uh-huh. Yeah. How many years did it take you to do that? And I'm posting a link to the podcast guys right now in the chat and on the website. Um, so it's been what, this is the eighth year. So I've averaged, um, you know, 52 a year, except for that stint in South Africa where I was doing them daily. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. I look at that and I, and I, it really contradicts this belief I have about myself. Like I don't have staying power. Like I do something and then I have to move on. Like, look at you, you've, <laughs> You've stayed with something for a long time. I'm very proud of it. So when you get into those numbers, it's hard to remember every guest. I mean, you know, vividly, but I'm just wondering, did you, do you have a favorite or several favorites that, that stick out in your mind? So people that are watching, that are just hearing about you. Where would you direct them? Yeah. Well, some of them have been like, I love interesting conversations, but it's like reading a, reading a, a work of fiction. Like you read it, you enjoy it, and then you put it down and it doesn't, but then there's others that were like so um, useful. So one, like, and some of them really like, after the conversation, I'm like, I gotta do things differently. I have to learn about this. I have to change what I'm doing as a, as a coach, as a teacher to be more effective because I didn't know about this and now I do. And I know, I don't know enough. So one of those was uh, a book by uh, uh, a guest called Scott Carney who wrote a book about Wim Hof way back before Wim Hof was famous about what called What Doesn't Kill Us. And it was about cold exposure and basically the importance of environmental stress. And you know, you and I are both well-versed in the, uh, was it the pleasure tra tra uh, trap, the, the uh, motivational triad. And the idea that human beings are programmed to do easy stuff. Right, the whatever, like, you know, oh, I'm gonna rest. Oh, I'm gonna eat whatever is highest calorie density. 
oh, I'm going to avoid any sort of, and that was okay for, it's not a flaw, right? That worked for thousands of years because our environments naturally restricted what we could do. If you laid around all day, you'd die because you wouldn't get anything done. You only ate uh, honey and sweet fruit, you'd die because there wasn't around that much, right? You know what? Eat a grub, eat a root. And what I realized was we were also missing from our environment, not just, you know, the need for uh, exercise and the abundance, the, the abundance of healthy food to the, extent, to the uh, exclusion of everything else. We also were missing stress. And like, if you go through life at 68 degrees Fahrenheit and 52% relative humidity, then your nervous system is actually like a dog without a job. It's going to start chewing on furniture, right? So that, that was episode 197. That made a huge impact on me. Nice. Um, another one that I loved, um, 224, Will Bonsall. So I'm, I'm a plant-based eater. I think I'm a vegan. I don't exactly know what that means for me. I haven't, I haven't, eat, you know, I haven't done anything that would be considered not vegan in eight years. But, and I'm very interested in permaculture in kind of farming and gardening that is in, in keeping with how nature works. And most of that discipline involves using animals whether it's you know, the, the guy in South Africa who says that uh, holistic grazing of cattle is what's gonna to restore topsoil, uh, or you should have chickens in your garden because they're gonna eat the mulberries and, and poop fertilizer, and they're gonna eat, like, you know, I love chickens. Um, and this one guest is a veganic permaculture gardener named Will Bonsall. And he's also known, he's this, like the, the, um, the Noah of seeds. He has an ark. Um, where he stores all these seeds that are from plants that have gone, you know, pretty much extinct. And he's like, we, they, you know, they don't taste very good now, but who knows when we're going to need this genetic uh, resilience and variability in the future. So that really got me gardening in a veganic way. Like if I, you know, if I get, if you come to my house and I feed you those giant sweet potatoes and I fertilize with cow manure, how vegan is that? Interesting. Right. Or even if I eat tofu that I buy at the store, tofu is pretty cheap, like two bucks, three bucks a pound. It's cheap because it's being subsidized by the pig industry. Because when you make tofu, you made tofu, right? From scratch. From the I'm beginning. allergic to soy. So no, no. Well, if you do it, it's like you get your blob, blob of tofu and you also get this other mass that is, is pig food. So that gets sold. You know, tofu companies sell that to pig farmers. So my cheap tofu is being um, subsidized by animal agriculture. So it made me realize like, it's not just like as vegans, we can get very defensive about like, what are you eating? Did you eat this? Did you, you know, as you know, and it's much bigger than that. And the, you know, the, the like for me, vegan is a one way of answering the question, how can I live in a life of justice and compassion? And so I started exploring all these other, like, what does that look like to live a life of justice and compassion? I've talked to a lot of black activists in the past year um, around what it's like to, to bring whole food plant-based to the black community. Um, what it's like to experience racism in the vegan community, right? Like, you know, this just, a, a lot of the episodes are really kind of sort of painful for me because I'm like, oh yeah, I do that shit. Can I say shit? Yeah, you can say shit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I didn't realize that. Like, I, I own that. I apologize. You're right. That's, you know, why didn't I think of that? And so, so it's, it's also a, um, a kind of a stage on which I get to model um, a willingness to be wrong and to be corrected. Which, which I think is important. Is there, is there anyone that you've been wanting to have on the podcast that you haven't been able to get on so far? Um, <laughs> honestly, I would love to uh, podcast with Bruce Springsteen. I saw him in an elevator once at Cedar sinai but that was a long time ago. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, 
No, I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of sort of famous people who are sort of above my pay grade, but you know what? Rich Roll gets a lot of them. Like, and he's so good. Um, like very often I'll be listening to one of his podcast interviews and I'm like, well, I really want to talk to that person. And by the end of the interview, I'm like, I really don't need to talk to that person. <laughs> I got it. Right. Um, I, th I think, I, you know, what I, what I love is that what uh, my niche is largely people other people haven't heard of. Like I like to be the introducer. I, I feel the same way. I mean, with this show, you know, mm -hmm. I like to, to, I like to be, I like to be the, the one that's telling the village about some great person. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's, there have been people who haven't, who haven't said yes. Um, yet. Yet. Uh, or, who, or who have said no, but you know, is there anybody that you've interviewed that you think would like to be on my show or that I should ask? Because that one, I don't want to say the name, but the one person I did ask, that person said no. And like when people say no, it kind of hurts my, I don't like to ask people that I think are going to say no. Hmm. Let me think about it. Okay. Um, I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure I have a list um, somewhere. Yeah. And anybody that you think is great, I would probably like as well. So here, this is really interesting because I didn't know you were writing a new book. And it, it, this is so perfect because somebody sent in a question for you because they know that you, you know, you do things dealing with behavioral change. So a lot of times that's what you've talked about when I've seen you at conferences and things like that. I actually met you at a conference. It was uh, Summer's Fest the first time I heard you speak. And what I really liked about you, and I'll always remember this, is I, you know, I, before pandemic, I used to produce conferences. I did 19, this last year would have been my 20th in different cities like Vegas and LA mostly. And you were giving a talk at that really, there's this one room there in the engineering building that is not really ideal because you're way down there. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, it might be great if you're taking a college chemistry class, but you're way down there and the people are way up there. It's not, it's not very warm. You know, you can't really interact as well. And you were giving a talk and your PowerPoint, it just, they couldn't get it to work. And I have been in lectures so many times with people that are like real prima donnas that when the technology doesn't work, they flip out and then they yell at the people like as if that's going to help yelling at like some volunteer. And I just remember my first impression of you and that, you know, they say you don't have a second chance to make a first impression. He's like, you are so gracious. And just like what they teach us, I study improvisational comedy and stand up. You can went with it. Like you couldn't, and I'm guessing that's probably what you did in South Africa. Like you couldn't get the PowerPoint to work. So you didn't just like flip out and get mad. You just gave the talk to the best of your ability. And, and it was actually quite delightful. And you were like, and you would say something and said like, well, if the slide was, you know, and, and I just, I always remembered that about you. And I really liked you because of the way you behaved in that situation. Thank you. I think, I, I think, you know, you caught me at my best, right? I probably had a really good night's sleep the night before and I was eating healthy vegan food. So I'm not always, <laughs> I'm not always that gracious. I also, I also remember that the mic didn't work and the air and the AC was really loud. But, but you did a great job. And remember when, when we saw each other in your home city, I was speaking at a, a veg fest and they did not have the ideal situation. They put us in a room with all the vendors with no acoustics. And you, you, you know, I had sort of like was in that position and I wanted to get angry, but like there was nothing I could do about it, but you ran my tech. So I have nothing but fond memories of you. But anyway, so a lot of times when you speak, you, you, you know, you do talk about behavior change and it's perfect because the question that came in today from Natalie is about that. And then you happen to be writing a book and you're, you're going to talk about that too. The title, I believe you said is you, you can change other people or. Right. Okay. Right. And of course my phone is not loading right now. This is killing me. All right. I'm going to have to look it up on email. Don't you see again, another example of when technology doesn't work. So I'm just going to be gracious. And luckily I can just jump screens here and get this question. I did well, out of deference to the environment. I didn't print it out, but anyway. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you the, 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 there was a moment that prepared me for that and every other technological failure that's ever occurred, which is <clears throat> I was giving a talk to about 300 people at a conference in the year 2000 and I was relying on tech and it failed and I bombed. I've never received such bad reviews in my life. People were angry during the presentation. They were hostile. It was a conference that was part of a group 
where had I done well, I would, it would have made a difference to my career. And I had, I had planned a, a video link hookup with someone in another country. This is the year 2000. Like, do you, can you imagine how insane I must have been to think that that was something reliable? Um, I had not prepared properly. And that was such a bad experience. Like I just went back to my, my hotel room and cried. And like, that will never happen again. And so I started, I started talking to people like professional speakers. And like, it was like, how do you prepare for a talk? And they started telling me things like, have three backups, mail your, mail your slides, have a computer with your slides, have a thumb drive with your slides. I think this might've been back in the time when we actually had floppy disks, I don't quite remember. Um, assume nothing will work. Can you give the talk from memory? Do you have it something on paper? Um, and if all else fails, just don't be a dick. I know. Yep. I agree. You have to have a backup and, and you know, it's hard, especially like when, you, when I've done cooking demos and the electricity doesn't work and it's like, okay, you got to find another way to entertain them. You know, my, I used to study, you know, uh, public speaking with a coach and he said, there's two kinds of baggage, carry on and lost. <laughs> and so that, that anyway, so great. So I was able to pull up the question and then you can answer it. And also then maybe talk in context of your book, because it sounds like what she's asking might be in your upcoming book. She says, I have two brothers who have both had quadruple bypass surgery in their fifties. And my 56 year old sister has very high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and is overweight. The doctor wants to put her on statins as soon as possible. I have lovingly encouraged her and sent her lots of information over the years on the benefits of a whole food plant-based diet, but I simply can't get through to her. She makes every excuse in the book and firmly believes that this is genetic and there's no way around this. Can I change her mind or do I just let it be? My brothers did make some changes after getting their chest cut open, but they too believe in moderation and think I'm a bit of a nut. Mm -hmm. Yep. So... It's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful and painful question and one that almost all of us face. Like, and we don't, we don't have to be health nuts to face it. Like we all have people around us that we want, we wish would change. Right? Whether, so, and sometimes we want them to change for their own good and sometimes we wanna change because they're driving us crazy, right? And so here's, here's what I'll say, I don't know in any given situation, I don't know how to change someone. What I can tell you is based on research and practice, what are your best odds ways of approaching people, right? So, um, and you know, a lot of this, you, you remember uh, Doug Lyle's great talk, how to um, get along without going along, right? Sort of the psychology of not, basically he's saying, don't make yourself superior to them. Right, so that's that's kind of the basis. So how do we do that? Um, right, the first the first thing is if I tell you what to do. In most situations, you will resist, right? Because we all have a need for autonomy. Right, and especially if I so it's different. It's like if you come to me and you say, "How I got a question about something," and I give you an answer, you go, "Thank you," right? You have. So the question is, what kind of permission do you have to speak? Do you have permission to offer your opinion? Right? You know, you've heard the expression, when I want your opinion, I'll get, I'll, 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 I'll tell ask you for it. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> right? When, when, I want, when, when I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. Right? So, so the first thing is to get into, we need permission before we can even begin to have the conversation. And there's a bunch of ways to try to get permission. Now, one of them is, in this case, it sounds like we're in a deficit. This person who's writing to you has all, is like, how, do, how does her, how do her brothers, um, and is it her sister? She has two brothers that had both had open heart surgery that still believe in moderation. And the sister who's overweight and has disease right. markers is doctor wants to have her go on statins like right away. Okay, so it's through her three siblings, three mm -hmm. of her siblings. How do they think about her, right? Like if you ask them, like Blake, what, tell me about, you know, let's let's I don't know, we can let's give our let's give our our reader or our, our uh, questioner a fake name. 
Well, I gave her a real name, Natalie. Nat Natalie, okay. Great. Yeah, so, <laughs> but you can give so, her a fake name if you prefer. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I did, that, that flew past my, my consciousness. <laughs> um, what is what do her siblings think of Natalie? I mean, I don't know. I, I think Natalie's lovely. I know her. Uh, yeah, know. they they think, oh, you know, we love her. She loves us, and boy, she's a pain about this health stuff. She she can't let it go. Right. She keeps talking. You know what? We're going to get together. We're going to sit down. We're going to take bets on when she's going to bring up broccoli, right? Or, hey, you know, or you don't need to go on statins or uh, high cholesterol is reversible or it's, you know, the food, the, your genes load the gun, your food pulls the trigger, right? When, are, you know, when is she going to say that? We know it's coming. Oh, there it is, right? So they are, they're already primed for defense, right? You ever, um, you ever like come up to someone and tap them on the shoulder and they react kind of violently, <laughs> right? It's not that they think you're a terrible, but their, their nervous system is oriented towards defense. So that's where this, that's where my guess is Natalie is starting with them. So you're not gonna, you know, if something doesn't work, you don't just keep doing it more and more harder and harder. Like she's sending, okay, now I'm gonna send them forks over knives. Now I'm gonna send them cowspiracy. Now I'm gonna send them um, game changers. Now I'm gonna send them the starch solution. Now I'm gonna send them um, Rip Esselstyn's TED talk. <laughs> it's, it's not working, right? So what we have to do is repair that relationship or change how they think about you. So one is to, for a few, for a few meals, don't say anything. Right? Just, just be with them and love them. And you have to do, we have to do work on ourselves. So Natalie has to do some work on herself because she's approaching them in terms of a critic. Right? So the, the, the central theme of the book is if you want to change other people, you have to become an ally rather than a critic. And critic could be, you're doing this wrong. Critic could be, Here's some advice, right? If I give you advice on how to eat, I, was, I didn't criticize you. I just said, you should do this, right? But what's implicit is instead of what you're doing, I know better than you, right? And it's really hard not to be, when we're angry or frustrated or sad or fearful, right? So Natalie's probably scared for her siblings. She loves them and she sees the path they're down. She's expressing out of fear. And when we express out of fear, it's really easy to be a critic because now we're in some sort of fight or flight, right? Like we're primed for, um, for worst case scenario and we're communicating that to them. And, you know, people who stress eat, <laughs> like we don't, like the solution is not to give them more stress, right? There's, there's some really interesting research on smoking, anti-smoking posters that really highlighted the dangers of smoking. Like the picture was like, you know, a, a, a skeleton in a hospital bed with a cigarette or the picture of lungs with all, with all that gunk in them. And turns out that that just, smokers saw that, they got scared about what their smoking was doing for them. And in order to calm down, they smoked. <laughs> all right, so, we want to identify, we want to say, okay, so it's okay to have this negative emotion. It's okay to be fearful. Natalie, it's okay, you know, well, I'm not saying don't have the emotion or suppress the emotion or change the emotion, right? Honor the emotion that you're feeling, I'm scared. Now, the trick is, can you turn that into something positive? What's the positive behind I'm scared? So in other words, in order for Natalie to be scared, something must be true. It could, you know, and if for, one of them is because I love them and I care about them. So all of a sudden we've shifted things a little, right? Like I'm now Natalie's in touch with my love and my caring, not my fear. And then the second thing is when we see people doing self-destructive things, we, we make what's called a sort of a fundamental attribution error. Like people do stupid things because they're lazy or ignorant 
or stubborn, right? We heard, we heard in the question, there's a lot of stubbornness in, her, in these, th these three people, right? They just won't see the light. So what I, wanna, what I wanna ask is what's the positive intent behind the dysfunctional behavior, right? You know why people eat crap. Because it's addictive and it's delicious. It makes them feel good, right? Don't eat crap, feel bad. Eat crap, I feel good while I'm eating crap. I feel blissful, my problems go away, right? Any addiction. Right. So instead, so I mean, look at how our society thinks about addictions. Right. These people, they have no willpower. They they throw away their 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 future on a drug. Like, it's all punitive. It's all critical. <clears throat> instead of saying, what's it doing for them? What's the positive intent? Right. If you're eating crap, your positive intent is I want to feel good. And then the question is, why don't you feel good without it? Right, like something, something's missing. We have, we have to address that, right? When you, when you broke your addictions, that opened up a space for you to get to know yourself in a whole new way. Yeah. Right, so, so it turns out that <clears throat> the sugar, which you thought was the solution, was actually blocking the solution and pointing to the solution at the same time. Oh, once, once, I, once, I, once I see I'm using sugar as a self-management tool and it has all these negative consequences, what could I do instead? What are some positive self-management tools that I can use to replace the sugar, right? And I can't even begin to think about them until I separate myself from sugar. Right, you can't do this theoretically, right? You can be eating sugar and be in therapy for 30 years and understand completely how what's happened in your childhood and this betrayal and that trauma. As long as you're eating sugar, nothing's gonna change, right? So what's the positive intent behind their behavior? And you want that for them, right? Natalie wants them to feel good to be happy, to feel abundant, to connect, right? Maybe they're part of communities or families where this is the normal food and they don't want to separate themselves, right? We want, like, these are good things. Love, connection, positivity, happiness, bliss, pleasure. We don't want to say you don't want that. So when you think about that, we can then begin to empathize. And when you empathize with someone, you kind of make yourself an equal. Right. Oh, man, that's yeah, that's really hard. I totally. Right. You know, I'm you've had this quadruple bypass and I, I'm sure, you know, tell me about it. Like, was it painful? Was it scary? And I know you want to eat better and you find it really hard and, you know, it's like, I bet that's really scary. Right? Can you see the difference in the energy behind that? And why don't you just eat the? You know what? Breakfast? It's just my natural inclination is to do what's not effective. <laughs> okay, well, if that weren't true, I wouldn't have a book to write. <laughs> I'm not writing a book about uh, how to get up in the middle of the night and pee. <laughs> when when can we look forward to this book? Um, probably September. Nice. Well, maybe we can have you back on when it's out and then promote it that way as well. Talk a little bit more about it and maybe have, oh. I, I believe you said you were doing it with a co-author. Yep. Yeah. And so it's, it's basically, it's, it's four steps. So the first step is get permission. So everything I've talked about so far is part of that. How do you get permission to have the conversation? And it's very, you know, there's different stages. Like it's easier to get permission if, if you say to me, hey, I need your help with something. Okay. Then that's easy. If you say, oh, I am, I'm so low energy and I'm gaining weight during this pandemic and I get headaches all the time, that's a complaint, right? You don't hear any agency in that. You don't hear any ownership. It's just, here's, wah, wah, wah. here's some bad things. There are ways to then try to get permission from that place. Like it's still an opening. It's like, oh, wow, AJ, that sounds really, really tough. I'm sorry to hear that. 
would you, you know, can we, would you like to think it through with me? Right? It's a very non-threatening. It's like, would you like to hear my sermon about it? <laughs> it's, would you like to think it through with me? Does it matter if they ask for help though? Like, I wonder, like, you know, it, it, obviously you shouldn't contribute to somebody that doesn't, you know, it's not, not good to just go around and say, excuse me, I see you have this lifestyle disease. Why don't you, you know, or you see yeah. somebody that's maybe overweight with a shopping cart full of junk. You wouldn't, I mean, most people wouldn't do that, but is it, does it matter whether or not they ask for help? Yes. Like, yes. So if they don't, if you, if you are initiating that's the, that's the highest bar you have to cross. So that's why you get, good, you get right with yourself. Okay, I have this negative emotions. I'm gonna convert it to a positive value that I identify with. I love them, I care about them. I, a coworker isn't doing their job right. I value my boundaries. I don't wanna to have to redo their job at night. I value the, the product that our company is putting out in the world and I want it to be successful. Like whatever it is, um, to get in touch with your positive intent. And then to, if, it's, if you're initiating to say, hey, I'd like to talk to you about something. Do you got a minute? Or can we, can we chat about something? And then you state what you want for them. I really want to see you lick this disease. I really want to see, or you know, something that they can hear. I, I would love to see you, you know, not struggling with your weight anymore. Um, and I'd love to explore some of the things that are getting in the way. Are you open to that? All right, like that's the best you can do. And, and, and if you've been nagging for a while, one of the beautiful moves you can do is to own it. Is to say, you know, I know I've been, I know how I've been. I've been telling you things. I've been beating a drum about this. And I bet, and I know how annoying that is. And I'm sorry, like that's, that's not how I want to be here. Um, I'd love to be part of the solution rather than reinforcing the problem. Um, if you're open, if you're open to talking about it, like you, you know, when you own that and when, when especially when we exhibit vulnerability, it's an invitation to the people around us to be vulnerable too. Yeah, because if, if, if just nagging people worked, you know, it doesn't, you know, there's an old saying, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And I'm wondering, do you think that, I don't know how much you listen to Dr. Lyle, but he often talks about whenever there's a problem in a relationship, often look to status. And I'm wondering if that ever plays a part, because I happen to know Natalie, and she's like, fit, trim, healthy, and gorgeous. And, mm -hmm. and, do you, and I feel like sometimes people are, like you say, they're, they, they're arriving on the defensive, but sometimes that if, if you're not, they're already defensive. You don't have to say anything. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Well, it's like, it's, it's like, you know, ordering uh, vegan food at a restaurant, all of a sudden everybody hates you or <laughs> right. So, yeah. So there are opportunities like all, none of us, none of us is getting through life unscathed. Not, none of us doesn't experience pain and suffering and loss and weakness, right? So one of the things you can do is be open. Like, does Natalie have any part of her life where she is not totally 100% in control of her behavior? I know that she's watching because she just uh, sent me an email saying, you are right, I'm scared for my siblings because our father died of a sudden heart attack at the age of 47. So you, if you're still listening, Natalie, just answer that. Yeah, so there's a, there's a beautiful example of vulnerability to speak to them and say, you know, when dad died, remember how young we were? I was so scared. And you know what? The reason that I have been bugging you about this partly is because I don't want to experience that again. And I just, want, I just want you to know that like, that's where my heart is. And I know because I'm scared and because of my personality, I can come across as like preachy. And I know that turns you off and I'm gonna to try to do better. But I want, you, I, I want you to understand like, this is really, really important because I love you so much and I don't wanna go through that again. Like that's, that's opening your heart. It's hard for someone to then say, Mind your own business. 
So, you know, it's interesting because this, this really has made me think about a situation. Uh, it, it, I, had, I have a cousin who was my closest cousin and like more like a sister to me. And in 2010, she's a physician. She was diagnosed with breast cancer. And literally, I, I just said to her, I said, oh, you should read the China study. I wasn't like, you know, you know, I wasn't like that. I swear it was like, oh, you know, I'm sorry. You, and, and she hasn't talked to me now in 11 years. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and how, is there any way, I mean, is there anything I can do to, to, to you what's, know? What's the, what's the scariest truth you could tell her if you were to send her a text or an email or call her on the phone? I mean, so much time has happened. I don't even think I can, you know, 11 years. It just, I remember I was really sad. And I remember talking to Dr. Lyle, I said, oh, in about four years, she'll talk to you. And she still hasn't. And then her daughter even wrote me and said, how dare you accuse my mother? And it's like, that's not what I was doing. And, and why can't people just know that you, you, when you do this, even when you're a nag, it's from a place of love. You wouldn't do it to somebody you didn't care about. But I don't know how I could go back now, 11 years later. I, I've moved you know, out of LA and everything to, to even- Well, what I, what I hear is that it's still on your mind. Oh yeah, yeah. And that's what made me learn that like, I do not, I do not give my opinion unless, unless like, it's like somebody asks me or, you know, people, you know, people, I've had people like conferences say, you know, talk to my, you know, my, my son's overweight, talk to him. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, yeah. that's, that's, that's not what you no, do. Yeah. Here's, here's what comes to mind is like, what, what is up for you is not what happened 11 years ago. It's what's happening now. Like we were so close. I really miss you. And I think the way the way that I spoke to you when when you had that diagnosis um, really turned you off, and I'm sorry, and and I think about you all the time, and I miss you, and I would love to be in connection again. Yeah, I, I remember at one point I did reach out and say like, "Are you upset with me because of this?" And she's like, "No, I'm just busy." And I just, I you know, you kind of feel like, "No, that's not the truth." Because so, I don't. I'll think about it. Relationships are hard, man. Yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is great. Yeah. Well, I look forward so, to that book. So I'll give you one one more thing, which is so like, what do we do instead? Like once you've gotten permission, then we want to jump in and say, "Great, you give me permission. Read this. Look at this. Understand this." Uh, my intramyocellular fat, diabetes, well, like we want to then blurt. Do not do that. Like, first of all, the information is absolutely the least powerful thing we have. Right? Because we, we know this because like people can change on a dime with just a, an offhanded comment, right? Or just seeing someone, like someone who just happens to watch you do an Instant Pot demo. And you make uh, your lentil soup, red lentil soup with the with the dates, and they try that, and you sing a song, and you stand on your head, and you're funny, and you flirt with the old men, and they go, "Oh, I love AJ. I'm going to do this, right? You haven't convinced them of shit. You haven't taught them anything. You've made them feel a certain way, and you've presented them with a." Um, a path, an avatar, like, oh, this, I want to do this, right? So it, it wasn't the, the information in the lecture, it was something else. So what, you, and what we want to do is get people to a place where they are making, where they're empowered, where they're taking ownership. So instead, so when someone gives me permission, what I don't do is, okay, here's what to do. What I do is I ask them a lot of questions. So I'm just, as, as a coach, and the first one is, so what, what's the outcome you want? What do you want here? I told you what I want. What do you want? What would be, if you could solve this in exactly the way you'd want to solve it, what would it look like? Well, you know what? I'd be eating the way I eat now and I'd be healthy. Okay. okay. Um, you know, is that, what have you tried? <laughs> Like you can get them to a place of um, sort of, you know, creative helplessness. Like, you know, okay, yeah, I would, you know, I would love that for you. I would love a world where we can, where I can eat chocolate three times a day and be healthy and, and lean. I would love that. I agree with you. Um, you know, I don't know how to help you get there. 
right? But you know, usually they won't say that. They won't, you know, they'll say something real. Um, God, I would love to have to stop worrying about, you know, I would love to get this under control so I know that I have 20 or 30 years left. So I'm not, I don't feel like a ticking time bomb. Right? I would love to stop eating sugar, right? People come to your ultimate weight loss. What do they want? They want to lose weight usually and, they want. and stop the cravings. Yeah, they want to, they want to eliminate um, negatives. I want to get rid of weight and I want to not feel bad. And then so I says, wait, what do you want? Like at a certain point, that becomes an interesting question. To the, the, like, at some point people can start asking it on their own, like, oh, I'm healthy now, but my life sucks. I'm in a bad relationship. I'm doing work I'm not interested in. And now I have all this energy. Gee, what am I going to do? Like, like Garth Davis talks about after he got, after he fixed his diet, he was like, I got to start running. I got too much energy. He got into, he became a gym rat and, you know, and now he's so good looking that uh, millions of scammers steal his picture every year. <laughs> so helping people see like, what's, what's the outcome you want can start to just like you turned yourself from defensive to negative to seeking a good, you want them to do the same thing. Let's, let's go for something good. Great, what you wanna lose weight, tell me what that would be like, right? So what's your why? Like, tell me what your life is like at your ideal weight. Ooh, God, I could have that. Tell me what your life is like when you are, um, when you don't need statins, All right? Um, so there's, you know, there's four steps. So this is the second one is to um, identify an energizing outcome, right? And then the rest, I don't think we have, we have time for now, but it'll be in the book is, you know, to figure out what's the opportunity and then crafting a plan to help them get there. And information, rather than you um, fire hosing them information, like as you're crafting the plan, they'll be like, well, I'm not really sure what to eat. How could you find out? Well, you know, don't you have those cookbooks? Sure, would you like me to send you one? Right, so, so it's constantly, you're taking a step back to invite them to take a step forward. Nice, this sounds great. I will definitely, I hope you'll do the book on Audible as well, because that's my preferred way of reading a book these days. I think, yeah, I think we do, we do have a, um, an audio book contract. Uh, I think uh, my co-author Peter will be probably reading it. That's so, good. you know, it's interesting because I've been posting the link to your podcast in your last episode is this is really synchronicity is how to change people without being an a-hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's on my mind. Yeah, so that's great. Well, thank you. It's just great catching up with you. Likewise, likewise. I'm glad you're back home safe and your family's well. And uh, seriously, like the, when the book comes out, let's schedule something for, you know, that week or so, so we can get people to buy it. Awesome. I, I so appreciate you have been, you have been such a promoter of my work since we first met. You have introduced me to lots of people, given me lots of opportunities and put some um, potatoes in my pocket. <laughs> well, good. All I ask is if you can think of somebody from your show that might be a right fit, uh, please refer me. I will absolutely do that. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Howard. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we have a wonderful cooking demo from Marissa Wolfson. She's from the film Vegucated and she has a new cookbook, Family Friendly. She's going to be making a peanutty sweet potato soup. If you see Kathy Hester, tell her I said hi. Will do. All right. Take care.